Assalamualaikum and hi everyone today I'm Muhammad bin Abdul Salim and my fellow group mate will present the answer for the question that given in assignment part A. Without wasting more time, we go to question number three. The question is the rule of 57 on insurance cover for clients' money, values appraisers, estate agent, and property managers act 1981 at 242 and rules. Briefly explain the use and the importance of the client's account. According to the act, for to rule 57 ensure that the client's uh, funds are protected through insurance coverage this act an extra layer of protection in fraud theft or mishandling of fund fostering financial safety and also transparency in real estate transaction the use and importance of rule 57 is first as talked about financial security the client's account serve as a shield for the client's to ensure from any of misuse or mishandling. Next up, transparency and trust. Utilizing a dedicated account not only ensure transparent handling of funds but also boost a bridge of trust between real estate agents and clients. Now, regulatory compliance according to Standard 9 of Nation Estate Agent Standard, which is MEAS, maintaining a client's account is not just a good practice. It is a mandatory. And lastly, moving on to the client's account using just a storage storage space. It is a dynamic tool that simplifies accounting processes and become a lifeline in time of fund recovery needs. That's all for me. Let's move on to the question number four with Hidayah. And Assalamualaikum, my name is Norita Binti Mazan and I will be presenting about question 4 which is about the differences. Okay, for the first one is the difference between registered valuer and registered appraiser. For registered valuer, it possesses the exclusive right to be referred as a valuer, land economies, property consultant and it is only granted after the completion of the test of professional competence or we call it as TPC where they are competent to become a registered valuer. Okay, on the other hand, for registered appraiser, they are registered under Part 5 of the Act because of their long experience and earlier registration under various appraisers Act before independence. Okay, next is the registered valuer was enforced after the independence while registered appraiser was enforced during the colonial era which was before independence. Moreover, in terms of valuation process, registered valuers serve various purposes including uh, facilitating financing and credit faci facilities, aiding in acquisition and disposal decision, taxation or even statutory requirements. Meanwhile, for registered appraiser, they also practice valuation and property management but unlike the valuers, appraisers are limited or restricted in practice by geographical era and area and value. Okay, in terms of fee, according to Act 242 for valuers, they have a processing fee of 75 ringgit, which stated in Rule 17, and 150 ringgit for registration process fee in accordance to Rules 20 and 28. And additionally, they also have to pay an amount of 200 ringgit annually specified in Rules 20 in order to obtain the authority to practice, or as known as ATP. Meanwhile, for registered appraiser, Rule 17. Rule 17 mandates that registered appraiser have to pay a processing fee of 50 ringgit, registration fee at 75 ringgit according to rules 20 and 28, and for the authority to practice, registered appraiser have to pay the amount of 50 ringgit annually according to rules 20, and for the renewal of authority to practice, it is 50. It is also 50 ringgit annually for those with restriction and 150 ringgit annually for those without restriction. Okay, another clear distinction between registered valuer and registered appraiser lies in their respective registration numbers assigned by the Board of Valuers Appraiser and is the agent or as known as Bovia. Okay, for registered valuers, their registration number is denoted by V followed by a series of digits. While registered appraisers are identified by a registration number beginning with A followed by a numerical sequence Q, 
Okay, next we go to the differences between registered valuer and probationary valuer. Okay, first, what is a registered valuer and probationary valuer? First off, a registered valuer is a qualified professional who has been the test, who has been passed the test of professional competence or known as TPC, which encompasses five key components which are professional experiences, work diary and logbook, records of experience, should do practical tasks and even a professional interview. The test of professional competence indicates that the individual has met the essential standards and requirement on practicing valuation. Hence, for registered valuers who has passed the TPC and has achieved the authorization to practice under Section 16 of Act 242, they can practice or, or set up a business using the designations like valuer appraiser land economies, property consultant, or any similar terms. Meanwhile, for probationary valuer is someone who has not passed the test of professional competence or known as TPC. They are still in a probationary period until they successfully completed the assessment. Other than that, according to Act 242, Section 17 stated about the registration of valuer, while Section 17A is for the registration of probationary valuer. Both have similar requirements for registration, which are the attain of the age of 21 years, sound mind, not convicted any offence involving fraud or dishonesty, and not not an undischarged bankrupt and pay the fee prescribed by the board but the difference is within the requirement at section 17 is for the registered valuer is that the registered valuer is not under suspension from estate agency or property management nor nor that has his name been cancelled from the register Moreover, registered valuer is authorized to sign and set up any firm while probationary valuer is not authorized to sign and set up any firm since a probationary valuer is someone who has not yet successfully completed the TPC compared to registered valuer. The TPC proves that the candidate is liable and competent to do professional valuation services. Therefore, signing documents uh, denotes a certain level of knowledge, responsibility and capability which a registered valuer is capable of since he has passed the TPC and it seems and it seems goes to the setting up a firm where only registered valuer is capable to offer a comprehensive range of services from estate agency to property management services. Okay, next in terms of fees. According to third schedule of Part A of the Act 242, the registration fee for registered valuer is 150 ringgit based on Rule 20 and 20A, and fee for the authority to practice or ATP that must be renewed annually is 200 ringgit based uh, based on Rule 20 of the schedule. Meanwhile, for probationary valuer, the res registration fee is 100 ringgit, while the processing fee is 50 ringgit only, according to Rule 17. Lastly is forms. Okay, there are certain documents that is requested by the board that both registered valuer and probationary valuer has to submit. But there are differences in the forms that they have to submit for both individuals. For registered valuer, they have to submit a registration form using Form A for obtaining the authority to practice must use Form G. And for the renewal of authority to practice that is required to do annually must be using Form D. Meanwhile, for probationary valuer, there is only one form that they needed to submit, which is the registration form using Form A1 as according to Section 18 of Rule 70 of the schedule. Okay, last for question 4 is the differences between broker, real estate negotiator and registered estate agent. Okay, but first, let us look at the context of a broker. A broker is an individual who acts illegally on behalf of themselves and is not registered under any firm, especially not been recognized or registered under the board. They do not have a license number which distinguishes them as illegal illegal practitioners in the realm of estate agency. In general, a registered estate agent or negotiator has a standard of getting a maximum of 3% 
fee that they will gain from their listing property but brokers on the other hand will mark up the selling price of their property in order to get more and more in more and more profit next brokers are often self-employed and they practice their services without any requisite qualification or examination with no standards to adhere to they are not a obligated to any specific regulations. Consequently, the public should be cautious as they are an unauthorized agent. Okay, uh, in contrast, for real estate negotiator or REN is an individual employed or engaged by an estate agency firm as a salesperson to assist them in the estate agency practice. Crucially, they possess a license number granted by the board itself with a REN in front of their negotiator ID. In context of fee, as mentioned before, they have a standard of 3% of fee but it may be below 3% as they needed to divide according to their registered estate agent that supervises them. Also, they operate under the immediate supervision of a registered estate agent and they do not have the authority to independently list properties and handle only those listed by their agency or the registered estate agent. Okay. For the requirements, they need to attend a full two-day negotiator certification course or as known as NCC to get, the, to get the certification which allows them to apply to be a real estate negotiator at the board. Okay, moving forward to the registered estate agent or as known as REA is a licensed professional individual who has been registered under the board and has the authority to practice issued. Uh, by the board under section 16 by providing estate agency services to clients. As same as real estate negotiator, they also possess a license number with a REA in the front in front of their ID. The license number solidify their credibility and trustworthiness within the industry. In context of fee, the maximum professional fee is is at 3%. Registered estate agent has passed the TPC, enable them to own and operate their own real estate agency firm and can employ up to 30 real estate negotiators. They, they also can independently list properties, manage and oversee property listings within their agency. For requirements, in order to become a registered estate agent, the individual must undergo a rigorous real estate diploma course followed by a two-year probationary period and the test, of the test of professional competence or as known as TPC. Okay, therefore, that is all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Reza Mahfuz Pintar Mizi. And in this video presentation, I want to shed the light on a critical aspect of business protection, which is professional indemnity insurance or PII and its paramount importance for registered valuation firms in Malaysia. So, in Malaysia, the legal landscape underscores the significance of PII for valuation firms. Sole proprietorships must adhere to a minimum coverage of 250,000 ringgit, while each additional partner within a firm requires coverage of 50,000 ringgit. So, these mandatory minimums establish a foundational level of financial protection, emphasizing the legal obligation to safeguard professionals. PII, essentially a risk management tool, enables businesses to transfer potential cost of loss to an insurance entity in exchange for a premium. It's crucial to understand that while PII mitigates financial impacts, it doesn't eliminate the possibility of severe harm. Instead, it acts as a preventive measure averting the loss of businesses, reputation, assets, and also the specter of bankruptcy. Let me illustrate the importance through the lens of a seasoned valuer in J. Asset. Although he hasn't faced situations requiring indemnity insurance personally, his insights highlight the potential risk faced by valuers. Minor inaccuracies in valuation reports can lead to a significant financial losses for clients, underscoring the preventive function of PII in minimizing personal liability and navigating potential legal challenges. Now, let's delve into the specific benefits for registered valuation firms. PII provides a thorough protection against personal liability 
safeguard business operation, builds client confidence, encourages foresight in insurance planning, covers defense costs, protects professional reputation, and also offers financial support for long-term success. Consider examples of losses covered under BII, uh, which are loss of documents, libel and slander, dishonesty of employees, vicarious liability, joint venture liability, continuous cover, coverage for claims related to previous business, and also investigation and inquiry cost. So, these are not hypothetical scenarios. They are real-world situations where PII steps in to provide crucial financial protection. So, in conclusion, professional indemnity insurance is not just a legal requirement. It's a strategic investment in the stability, credibility, and long-term success of registered valuation firms. As a professional in this field, it is our responsibility to ensure comprehensive insurance coverage, compliance with legal requirements, and proactive risk management. Then, let's continue to the question number 6, the Code of Conduct and Ethics for Registered Values Appraisers under Act 240. Let's dive into five types of misconduct and ethics to ensure professionalism and integrity. We go through to the overview of Code of Conduct. Part 10 of Act 242 outlines the Code of Conduct and Ethics for Registered Values and Appraisers. This framework guides professionalism in upholding services, stability to clients, and maintaining dignity of the profession. So first, no criticism of peers. Rule 72 prohibits registered, registered values and appraisers from criticized fellow professionals, for instance, commenting on peers' fees or services to clients is again ethical standard. Second, accuracy in statement. Rule, rule 74 emphasizes accuracy. Registered values and appraisers must not certify statements that are false or misleading. For example, certifying an incorrect opinion of values in the valuation report is a breach of ethics. Third, is no partic participation of non-registered entities in profit. Rule 70 prohibits registered values and appraisers from sharing professional profit with non-registered entities. This ensures the integrity of their professional work and maintain ethical standards. Fourth is careful use of values name. Rule 77 stress the careful use of registered values or appraisers name. Allowing non-registered individuals to use their name for services is strictly discouraged to avoid any damage to the profession, profession reputation. And lastly, firm liability for offense. Rule 81 holds a firm accountable for any offenses committed. If a firm under registered value supervision commits fraud or dishonesty, both values and the firm are jointly and severely liable. That's all for the question number 6. Rahizan will continue the last two questions. Alright, now I will continue to talk about matters forbidden for advertisement for any registered valuer. So, the Board of Valuers, Appraisers, Estate Agents and also Property Managers has instituted prohibitions in promotional activities. So, these restrictions serve multiple purposes, all geared towards fostering fair, transparent and trustworthy practices. First and foremost, Registered valuers and firms are directed to refrain from advertising services unrelated to their core expertise. So this means that the primary focus should be on showcasing services such as valuation, property consultancy, research, market analysis, and also feasibility studies. It's important to follow guidelines that explicitly exclude unrelated services such as insurance, or renovations from the advertisement. Keep it straightforward by listing services without adding specialized claims or focusing on specific geographic areas. Next, promotional content must not be laudatory. So, excessive praise or exaggeration such as 
the best or leading in the industry is discourage. Language use should be objective and avoid hyperbole. Moreover, advertisement must not actively solicit business, calls for action, unrealistic guarantees, or promises that cannot be delivered are strictly prohibited to maintain professionalism and prevent misleading practices. Mission statements, slogans, mottos, and also quotations are not permitted in corporate advertising. So, while essential contact details like addresses and phone numbers are allowed, this exclusion aims to maintain a professional and straightforward tone. So, the goal is to avoid subjective or promotional language, ensuring transparency and also accuracy in conveying information to the public. Furthermore, advertisements should not contain any other information even if factual. So, this strict restriction emphasizes a focus on standardized approach, prioritizing uh, clarity and also conciseness in communication. By limiting content to essential information, the board seeks to avoid unnecessary complexity and promote a uniform res representation of services within the industry. So, in conclusion, the board's guideline to underscore a commitment to ethical and professional practices in pro promotional activities by adhering to these regulations, registered valuer appraisers and estate agents contribute to the overall integrity of the industry.